Uh, this is going to be important and make sure we're recording. This is going to be important information for you because there will be some fiscal information about P, uh, the children that you have in child fine. And so she is going to um, actually, I need that agenda, Jen. I'm sorry. I can't do it from memory. Um, so she's going to be talking to us about the flow chart, the process for referrals and child find in this age group. And then um, we are going to be talking about um, a, a, some fiscal finalizing documentation for what is funded. Um, we're gonna talk to you about our communication <laughs> plans that we're going to be able to provide for you around this work. And, um, and then we're gonna be discussing the revolving renovation fund, which this group has access to being in cohort one. So I know that there was um, some indication, and again, I was not here last week, but I think that this was um, supposed to be a largely fiscal meeting today. There is going to be a fiscal component, but we um, just have one SAU that had particular questions. Um, when it comes to main care, we're going to be meeting with you individually to tell you what those next steps are if you are interested in building main care again not a requirement for you and something that um, doesn't need to be doesn't need to be on your radar if you're not already currently billing or have an interest in billing but for those of you who are interested in billing um, again we will be talking to you about that individually so i think that with that i am going to unless megan there's something else okay let's um go ahead and have uh share Susie if you could share your screen and talk about the uh organizational flow will will do let me see if I can and Susie just heard a clarification the Miro board link that you're about to show is what is linked in the agenda that Jen Hopkins sent out correct yes sure is how's that can you see it I can't see what you guys can see. Yes, it's pretty small though. Yep, that's, I'm just gonna give you the 50,000 foot view for a moment. Um, the purpose of providing a flow chart or designing a, you know, this document was to support school district programs that are taking on some new responsibilities to kind of understand that um, looking at where children are currently attending and programs that they're attending for preschool age children that are going to be getting their special ed services from the school districts that are in this cohort um, to be able to share with you at what point um, in the uh, IEP or evaluation process that funding will become available. So we have two kind of phases. One is the very first uh, phase in this turquoise color where we're looking at that multidisciplinary evaluation process that is prior to the environment that we're deciding uh, that about that children will attend. And so I can zoom in a little bit to kind of share with you what we've um, how we've been um, designing this is that um, in terms of the evaluation process uh, at the very bottom here, we're looking at um, where uh, children are currently identified and the program that they're in. And then kind of scrolling over here to this next section is looking at that child find process, the evaluation process that schools will go through, um, the eligibility determination process, and then um, considering uh, IEP development with families. So this would be at a child level, um, what, um, as you're working with that family to determine uh, a child's um, eligibility, we're looking at um, th that referral process, the decision to um, go ahead with an evaluation. And then what we're attempting to do is indicate that at what point in the evaluation process can funding be expected. And um, what, what funds would be available to the school district. So for example, um, when the district decides to um, go ahead with an evaluation, they could be funded for, um, for that child find for the evaluation. 
um, if the child is not going ahead with that evaluation, there wouldn't be funds for that. I mean, kind of making logic um, at, in the different steps um, that we go through. So um, when the child is enrolled in the school district, then what kinds of funds the child would be eligible for. We were trying to, you know, kind of connect it to which buckets of funds that the that those would come from, so that you can anticipate that. So that's kind of the end of the IEP process, and then moving or the evaluation process, and then moving into the IEP process. Really looking at um, what needs to be in the IEP. Obviously, um, what kinds of information needs to be in the IEP. Uh, around how the child is currently functioning, because we want to make sure that these decisions that are being made are always with an eye towards putting the child in there, uh, keeping them in either the program that they're already attending and ensuring that that is the least restrictive environment for them. So that kind of comes to this last section, which is the location for services and supports. That is one of the last discussions after the present level, after goals, after services, after um, program modifications and supports, and then looking at the various um, locations for services, whether or not they're in a regular early childhood program, in a um, uh, attending a regular early childhood program for part of the day, and then um, special education for part of the day, that's this kind of yellow group, and whether or not they're in a separate setting or a separate class in a program with primarily children with disabilities. And then what kinds of funding is uh, allocated to children at these different in these different environments. So that's Susie, what I want to just um, someone asked in the chat, and I think it's important to understand this LRE decision tree is only pertaining to part B619. This is not pertaining to part C. You will be involved in the C to B transition, which has to occur by the third birthday. But this information that Susie is going on is one of the reasons we asked her to do this is I think many of you know that there's a lot and it's come out in reports. There's more restrictive placements for this group in our state because of the reliance on private schools to be able to provide these services. So we really have two goals with this. One is to kind of help us make sure that we are targeting a least restrictive environment for these kids. We know that when they are in restrictive settings, it makes it very challenging for them sometimes to transition into a kindergarten classroom. So we also know in CDS that lots of times one-on-ones -on -ones are assigned to children in this age group based on program requirement and not on an IEP requirement. And that is a cultural factor that has occurred with CDS throughout the years. So that's why we're really taking some time and you guys will wanna like look at this and digest it. There's lots of national literature on or national information on LRE, but in Maine, as you know, this is a struggle that we have in our school age population. It starts right here with this group. It's this more restrictive placement starts in, in our, C, in our um, CDS group of children at this point. And one of the benefits of you all taking a look at these children and being more involved is to really look at that LRE setting and, and say, wow, does that child really need a self-contained special education program or is it possible for them to have some time in the general education setting? So that's why we're focusing on this. And again, Susie's not gonna go to the minute level of what this is, but you're gonna wanna take some time to look at this. And then there's some acronyms on here that um, we are, you know, we have in here like regular education childhood program. RECP. So just, um, again, there's going to be new acronyms that, um, that folks are going to be, be conversing with. Um, the special education childhood program is the SECP. No? Yes? Right. So <laughs> there's a lot, and we're, I'm not actually allowed to use Mac acronyms. I'm actually been forbidden to use them, but I'm telling you that there are some, there's some there are nationally, codes. Mm -hmm. they're codes and they are going to be you're going to be fluent in them as you're kind of looking at what the LRE is. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Susie. I just wanted no, to make you're sure fine. people knew this wasn't a Part C um, 
uh, exactly and you know to add to that Erin um, when we what well, we've correlated um, the data for the outcomes of children that are in these various settings and we've seen that children who have access to a regular early childhood program where the majority of children are children without disabilities that they um, the the progress is much greater regardless of their gender ethnicity or disability category and so um, I think it's important for everybody to know that you know we are looking at outcomes trying to ensure that children are making um, a lot of progress in our preschool programs um, for children with disabilities. And so this is one way to um, increase that possibility. So we are still working on this. And um, so hopefully in the next you know, few days, we'll have this kind of nailed down as to what funding. And over here are the different funding sources that we've identified that um, when you're in preschool special education so for children that are three to five years old, the various funding, there's like six different buckets of funds that um, are available for preschool age children in your state. So that's awesome. And uh, we're trying to align those to the different locations uh, and environments that children will be attending. So we're almost done with it. And, uh, and I think it's pretty, it may look kind of complicated here, but once you, you know, read the, you'll be familiar with all the different stages of the IEP process. And so um, I see there are some hands up. We're ready to take any questions or put them in the parking lot. <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead. Her, she has her mic off. I know. I'm trying to ask her to unmute. But she may be in a car. Um, okay. We will. Oh, Scott, go ahead. You, folk, you may have already answered this, and I missed it in a previous meeting. But when we're talking about services and daycares, what, um, what would happen or what are our responsibilities when a student attends a daycare outside the confines of the district? Okay, so that is a great question. One of the things that you may not have heard um, is that childcare settings are going to be during this cohort, the equivalent of educational settings, as long as they have a two star quality rating from Maine Rising. <laughs> it's the uh, the organization that of point stars. You can just Google it and see. It has to have at least two stars. And for and we're still trying to ascertain what our level of our our like our minimum expectation is for that to be a school. But for this year, it just has to have a two star quality rating, and that will be considered an educational setting. So um, those kids that. Um, are out of your catchment area um, would likely, and again, this um, has not been finalized, Scott. So, you know, I know we talk about building the plane. You likely will be providing some general education funds and potentially some push in services or contract with CDS to push in a service in those areas that are outside your catchment area. So that's how we think that that's going to go. And this cohort is going to help us understand how that is working. If there's any problems during that time, then we're going to help you problem solve those. But at this point, the strategy is that as long as it has a two-star quality rating, it's going to be considered an educational environment. And then those services are going to be um, pushed in or telehealth in or however they need to be in um, and however you can provide that. You have the situation where the child is potentially attending out of state because you're right there in that line where we have um, some parents maybe electing to and we haven't actually got an answer for that yet. <laughs> so, but it is kind of a, um, you know, it, that might be one of the qualifiers that says we can't provide a faith obligation in a different state, but we don't, um, we don't have the answer to that yet. So uh, I think that Jen has, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, you've 
kind of mapped for the SAUs. And again, Scott, you're kind of a, maybe not, don't have this yet, but Jen has mapped where the children are currently that we know of and what child cares they are in so that you can have that information and start um, thinking about that. Um, and the other thing is that you know, if you have a FAPE offer in your community that's six hours a day, I think you have six hour programming. Is that correct? Yeah. So that could be your FAPE offer. You know, if you say I can, you know, this is what we have for you. This is what if you um, elect to go to a place outside of our state where we can't, you know, that could be more like a private or parental placement where you're monitoring for child find and maybe providing some consultation. So those are questions that we're going to be, um, it depends on how you are set up in your SAU, but you may say, listen, I can take your child in my program six hours a day. This is what I can offer. This is your FAPE offer. And this is the services that we can provide. If you want to go to New Hampshire or Vermont and take your child to take care, that's going to be, we're going to work with you on that, each of you individually, so that we can really look at analyzing who you have where and how we're going to, like, we're going to be looking at their rate and how we're going to be doing that. And we're also going to, at some point, be meeting, you know, um, having some of those conversations with the child care themselves. Go ahead, Megan. Two quick things. Leanne's uh, comment is, uh, instead of signing up for Miro, um, can this be downloaded into like a PDF or another version? Yeah, we'll take care of that, obviously. Um, I can absolutely understand the, another application i get it um so uh just a quick uh point of clarification is that um sort of the um the novel nature of being cohort one uh and the timing is such that um you know having those difficult conversations with families in august about a fape offer and try and you know possibly having um, an educational setting disrupted where they had been planning on sending their child not just for preschool but also for potentially before or after uh, care. Um, this is one of the reasons why we recognize that the timing is such that we really need to be mindful of, you know, sort of setting hard lines and saying, oh, you're gonna, you can hold a hard line and say, this is your FAPE offer and the families can take it or be parentally placed. So we are asking that, um, that, you know, we're, we're going to be as flexible as possible for this first cohort to say that if the, the student or the child is already in a placement that has those two stars, um, that that is that basically we're trying to treat it as if CDS were still owning that FAPE obligation, how would they manage that child and make sure that services were, were provided? So that is sort of um, what we're really working toward at this point is is to to recognize that the, the timing of the um, effective date for this legislation. Right, and you know the the a lot of the inclusion work and um, the regulatory kind of conversations with the federal Department of Education is that their guidance says to let the child remain in the program that they are in or that they would attend if they didn't have a disability and provide the services there. So that is to be considered the child's least restrictive environment, the first location that the team would consider. And so, you know, allowing the child to stay in that program and providing that services, if at all possible, is what we are asking. You know, my understanding is that your state and your Department of Ed team is asking for you to do. I am going to stop sharing and uh, let us move on, but I can make this into a, uh, a an image. I just didn't want to uh, do it until it was done, until it was finalized. But just to give you an idea of what we're hoping to be able to offer you so that you can kind of move your way through that special ed process um, in, a, in a compliant way and consider all of the options for the children. Sandy, what, Susie, sorry, why don't you put a date draft stamp on that so that when we, if we do anything to update it, we can re, we can re give it in a PDF and then we can just say, make sure you're using the most recent version that has this date on it. So that way we can say, you know, this might have some changes, but it really is a nice overview really of, first of all, how child find happens, right? Um, 
Susie didn't go over that explicitly, but it's it kind of shows you the ways in which children are identified in this in age group. And then um, when the funding starts, which is basically for you special ed directors, when the consent is signed to evaluate for initial evaluation, that is when we have a green light for, um, for this um, pre-funding for children in referral. And then once they're identified, obviously they're added. I think it says enrollment. And I think the, the one thing that I would add is enrollment in special education. Um, so yeah, so when they're enrolled in special education, that's when that special education preschool program fund kicks in and you would have the adjustment made at your quarterly. Um, so let's say you've had two payments, you're at the third quarter. So the quarterly payment would be the adjusted adjustment for the um, remainder of the year. So um, that is how that will work. But we heard loud and clear that it is costly to refer children to special education. And we wanted to be able to provide some, some um, fiscal support for that. We um, researched kind of what that cost is for CDS in terms of the evaluation process. And, and that's how we um, were looking at that. And again, remember that this is um, a year of discovery. So if many of you come back and say, listen, this is, this is unrealistic. This is what, you know, like those conversations will be occurring as we do this with the intention of 100% of the funding for special education will be provided. So, and Aaron, keep- there had to be a lot of co- crossover conversations here to develop this from our monitoring team, from our fiscal team, from our special education professional development team. And so, you know, to get everybody's minds going through this process and thinking about all of the elements, it, it's been pretty, um, you know, complex. And uh, so we appreciate your um, support and, and, and any feedback that you have once we send this over to you. Can I just add one more wrinkle? <laughs> because that's all we have are wrinkles at this point, um, is that when we're, when the child is in child find, so you know one of the reasons we wanted to have this graphic was to really kind of talk about and show the progression. But while the child is in the child find process, that is a general education requirement. And so part of what this, this entire uh, process and shift is, is about providing the, spe- the co- 100% of the cost of special education but when that child is in referral, that's a general education cost. Um, and so that has also been a big point of discussion about sort of to, to what extent is that covered by this legislation. Um, another aspect of that also is then calculating the cost. And that is part of you know some of the work that, is, that has occurred on our end. And then for the purposes of our data team and the fiscal team, at what point does that student become eligible for the allocation and to, for your count? And so that's the other reason that we really wanna keep bringing everyone back to this graphic because it will really matter. So that we're all on the same page about when that student starts to count in terms of how much a school district can expect to be getting for that child. So any questions about the graphic um, and or about anything between child find to FAPE obligation before we move on to our next agenda item? Okay, sounds pretty quiet. So I'm gonna just pick up. Um, so Paula, unfortunately was not able to be here today. Um, so I'm gonna go over the material that she has provided me with. Um, and she was just going to talk about um, essentially the counts and the quarterly payments. I know there are a couple of questions. There's at least one pending question about um, coding that I believe we have that we have not yet uh, responded to. I think that we were searching for some answers to. Is that correct, Megan? 
I knew that there was a question about coding, but I don't know what the specific question okay. about coding was. Okay. Um, well, I think we were, we were, you were going to speak to someone on the seventh floor about timing. Yep. Okay. Um, so right now, uh, the school finance team is working with um, the cohort team to finalize the numbers and the allocations for the year should be coming out shortly. Um, we are refining those numbers. Um, I am going to share this document. I, can I share? I probably can. Let's see. Okay. So this is the document that Paula provided. <clears throat> um, she is, um, so we are working with, with Jen and Sandy to get the CDS sync numbers for three, four and five year olds with IEPs to do your initial estimate allocation. It will be divided into four payments. Um, July, October, January, and April. Unfortunately, because of when the law was signed, uh, the July payment is being pushed back until after August 9th, and we will hope to get that out um, as soon to that date as possible. Um, and, and give you the first inst installation of that allocation. The next, the October 1 counts, again, will be the second quarter, three, four, and five-year-olds, and child count. Um, child count, uh, um, what we've discussed is with the team is going to get an allocation that is slightly different because as Megan was just saying, it's, it's the evaluation and that's more regular education. So we've been working to find out just to get an estimate of what the costs are to do the evaluation so we can put in a per pupil cost for children that you may have on your roster that will need evaluation. Um, so that will be also included in these quarterly um, count updates. And so what's happening is for that second quarter, if your counts are lower, if your estimate is lower, there will be an adjustment to lower your allocation if it's higher, we will, um, we will increase it and that'll be across the rest of the remaining payments. For the January payments, um, again, we'll be looking at both the uh, counts of kids with IEPs, three, four, and five, and those that are in child fine going to be evaluated. So, uh, but at that point, if it's lower, we're not going to make any adjustments, only if it's higher. Um, and that would be across the two remaining quarters. Um, and then for April, which is the final, we would just do as again, we would not decrease anything, but if amounts were higher, we will increase the allocation. Um, we are still trying to determine this high cost child component. Uh, what we are asking for, we have been talking, and I think Barbara spoke of it last week, of trying to see if we can use um, uh, for the Grant for Me program uh, to collect invoice information that you guys would, will be collecting. We will need all documentation of expenditures to be able to really assess whether or not, um, you know, this these funds can be used for, 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 you know, if you're saying our allocation is just, it's just not there, we will need to be able to, to look back and see what trans, what uh, invoices you have to validate that, yes, this is an expense greater than what the allocation had said. Um, the other place um, Paula also wanted me to touch upon that we're still looking at, so the student counts, we are looking at four and five-year-olds for attending. Um, in the EPS formula, we're still sort of um, trying to play that out because we do not want to have a situation where um, if they're included here, even though you're getting paid for those um, kids outside, that it would hurt your EPS rates. So we're, we're still looking into that. Um, if they're attending outside of your classroom, then no, there would not be an attending count. Um, uh, 
So for so if it's contracted, it's not going to be in any of the EPS um, counts. Um, right now, Part W does not have anything mechanism for transportation. So again, we're going to ask you to um, collect those costs and provide us with um, estimates of that. And then, um, so if a four-year-old without an IEP is attending a preschool program in or contracted by, <clears throat> by the SEUs, that's assuming that the FAPE will be funded in EPS and will not be included in the special ed preschool fund. So there was that. And I also wanted to share, we have this, we have our coding. So the fund for this, for this pre-K special ed will be 2213. We have this on our website as a guide. It's not completely, it's not all inclusive, but we know that things will need to be coded to this 2213 fund. So when we look at your, um, your quarterly financial updates, we will be looking to see what those expenditures are in addition to needing um, invoices. So this is located, the sheet, if you don't know where it's located at, and I can put this in the link, but it is in our model chart of accounts, special ed, pre-K special ed programs. I had, there's a question in the chat about when was the list last updated? Well, uh, which list, this list? I'm sorry, let me see if I can find out. Where it's, it I think it was the chart of accounts, is that correct? Yep. Yep, um, that was updated just, um, I think it was in May. Lisa, do you have a specific question about something you were looking for in that? Many questions about what, what is in there. Okay. Yes. And I think Matt, I think Lisa is the one who, who has a question about the fund. So um, Lisa, if you'd like to, maybe you and I should uh, get together, have a call. Would that work? And then uh, most likely, and if you don't mind, Lisa, we'll, I'll write down your, uh, um, I'll, I'll annotate our call with the questions you have, because there's most likely as other people will have those questions. And we can use that if you, it would help us to, to sort of build it out uh, like a frequently asked questions about the coding. Okay, perfect. Were there any other questions, specific questions? pass it off to Sandy then. Thank you. Thanks, Ida. Hello, everybody. One of the things that we have been talking about when we've been meeting with SAUs to go over the um, potential services and supports that CDS can offer in the upcoming year is a communications plan. So many of you have asked, how, how are we supposed to be communicating um, all of this information to families of the students in the cohort one, contracted providers, referral sources in the area. So we have had somebody working on some uh, language, some template language that um, has all of the information for you to use, to take and uh, modify it for your district. That is going through final review here at DOE, and we, uh, we should have that out to you um, next week so that you can start um, communicating with the families um, and referral um, providers, contracted providers in the area, as well as um, any sort of agency that may have sent in referrals in the past. And this, of course, is different for each SAU. So I'm kind of making general statements because some 
um, SAUs have decided to have CDS continue to do the referral piece through this cohort one year and some are kind of, it's a hybrid. So um, you would take the language in that and possibly modify it. And if you needed support with modifying any of the communication, you can also reach out to us and we will help support that. But I, we've been talking about this coming out and I just wanted to give you an update that we are very close to having that ready for you. And I saw that there was a question and I didn't get a chance. Okay. It's a question um, about the EU. Yeah. Janet, I, I don't I don't have an answer to that. Um so the I, MOU, I think, is going to be helpful, but the way that the letters uh, that we have drafted are in place are really just about that initial explanation of, we are an SAU that has assumed the FAPE obligation, so you'll be contacting us. It's much more of a kind of an open-ended letter. It is not saying, and here's the extent to which I'm working with you as a provider or anything else like that. It's not at that level of detail. The MOU is also in final review. Um, we have the language finalized. The piece that needs to be plugged in at this point are the individual differences for each SAU in terms of what each SAU wants to do relative to their relationship with CDS. Um, and so that that work is being finalized and the MOU review um, is going to be the, the primary crux of our meeting next week. Um, but we have that just about ready to kind of walk through. Uh, much of what Ida sh just shared in terms of all the fiscal information is included in the MOU, but we will be following up with this um, in this meeting with the uh, a PDF of what Ida just shared. So you'll still have that, but another place it will be is actually outlined in that MOU. Sorry, Sandy, I didn't mean to jump in. No, nope, no, nope. I, I wasn't quite sure on how to answer Janet, so I'm glad you stepped in to help with that. Um, and, uh, some SAUs have also asked if we are communicating with families on our end, if CDS is, and we we will be working on that with directors. If families have not been notified, we will also be reaching out to them and notifying them of this transition as well. So do you want me to just move right into the revolving renovation funds topic? unless there are questions about sort of communication plans. Okay. Okay. Um, so at today at three o'clock, you've all received the email from Jen and there was a priority notice that we are doing an informational meeting on the pocket of money that was written into this law um, dedicated to the school revolving renovation fund, And just to review that these funds are to be used for priority one projects. And so those are specific to kind of like health and safety, any sort of structural repairs that would lead to health and safety, any sort of um, Americans with Disability Act compliance pieces um, so thank you. Priority one. Yes. And, um, this is like any other school revolving renovation fund. It's considered a grant and part of that will be, um, forgiven and a portion of that will be paid back. The deadline for that application is October 31st of this year. And you can find the application on the DOE school revolving renovation fund website and I Megan are you dropping that in the box as I speak okay I saw you um I was going to do that um but also the informational meeting today will be recorded and we will share that as well if folks cannot join us but also feel free to reach out with any questions um about that school revolving renovation fund any questions right now There is a question um, regarding the CDS MOU. Does it need to be in place before we communicate with the parents? 
Yep, we answered that. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm too okay. far behind. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep up. <laughs> it is. Um, just one more detail, and this will be outlined in today's meeting on the special revolving renovation, the school revolving renovation fund, is that the school revolving renovation fund program is one that is offered every other year. This is an off year offering. So it has resulted in some confusion. And unlike other school revolving renovation fund programs, this is a narrowly defined um, uh, sort of offering. And it is limited only to those SAUs that have voluntarily assumed the FAPE obligation for three and four and five-year-old students with IEPs for cohort one or cohort two. Um, and so um, it is, there's a bit of a process involved, but if you have not had an opportunity to um, make some school improvements to be able to provide as many uh, preschool classrooms as you would like, uh, or if you know that you wanted to add a playground and we're not able to do that, those are allowable uses for this um, because it is everything to do with adult, with um, uh, making sure that that programming, including recess and outdoor play, is accessible to all children. So um, it would be something that you would want to kind of jump onto. Um, you being in cohort one are one of the few, the proud, the eligible um, for this program. So um, something to consider um, and. Um, uh, there will be a lot of a uh, lot of good information this afternoon. Yes, Stella. So this is in in any type. You you are going and and basically issuing bonds, and so the bonds are 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 um, eligible. Basically, you do have to pay back, and it's at the same rate of your state and local share, essentially. Um, but it's a it's a very good deal. Um, in terms of what you get in terms of um, the cost. Great, I think we've gone through the agenda, unless there's, um, yes, thank you, Susie, Susie, for that wonderful graph. It is going to be well used in the state of Maine. Um, if that is all that we have, I think we will end our call here. I do um, want to just, if I could just jump in one, one sure, quick one. Sorry, yeah. Aaron. Um, I do want to just sort of... Um, Acknowledge that one of the things that we are seeking to do in these meetings, especially as the calendar page, and I'm sorry to say this and tell everyone that tomorrow will be August 1st. Mm -hmm. um, we know what that means in terms of the pace of all of your calendars. Um, these meetings are going to shift much more to informational. Um, and we're very mindful of, you know, your time is the most valuable thing that you have. And so we want to have tight meetings as tight as we possibly can. And to that end, we're using this um, organizational structure in the agenda that you've received um, that will outline not only what you can expect to happen that will be largely informational coming from us, um, but also the amount of time we expect it to take. Um, at the bottom, we have included an area for like parking lot or for questions. We really, really would like um, the if you have questions coming up that we can add them to that. Um, Leanne, I see your question in terms of about getting the agenda out to you sooner. Absolutely. And we have put into place some processes where we do believe that we'll be able to get these agendas out to you quicker um, so that you can make sure that you know what's coming up and so that you can make sure the right people are attending the meeting. Um, to that end, we will be also making sure that um, for our next meeting, there will be the MOU review. That is likely going to be something that superintendents or um, and or special education directors and or uh, business managers may be interested in hearing. Um, and you will also be getting an email from us about an additional training for the C to B transition. Um, that is a piece that we may use this time for, um, but obviously not everyone has the same interest in that. Certainly it's good information for say a superintendent to have, but it is much more important information for special education directors uh, to have and to understand 
what is meant by the C to B transition and how that that how that process is different relative to the kindergarten transition meetings that people are accustomed to. And, um, so, and, Meg, yeah. and Megan, our plan on that is to do like, you know, like the 10,000 foot level for the next August 7th meeting, okay. and then have some follow-up trainings for practitioners and for directors. So different levels, you know, how far into the weeds do we need to get for the different groups that um, need to implement the, the practices? Perfect, thank you, Susie. But um, yes, yeah, so I did really, I just wanted to kind of outline that as, as sort of an acknowledgement of you can start to expect from us sort of more detailed agendas and you, yes, we will be endeavoring to get them out earlier. And our next meeting is, yeah, we talked about that next, they're going to be weekly at this time. And if you have any questions that you'd like to answer, specific questions, I know we're doing a lot of more, um, we're doing some individualized meetings as well, but if you have certain things that you'd like us to be presenting on or please let us know. With that being said, we can stop the recording and everybody have a great rest of your week. Happy August. <laughs>